All right. Um, so the uh, plan now is to talk a little bit about diffusion of peer influence. For those of you that are just watching the recordings, the last one, um, uh, uh, you should watch them in order and you'll get the joke. But um, so the, the plan now is to think a little bit about um, peer influence and diffusion. And this is arguably the most, this is what social networks and health was probably keyed off of most. And so if you think of the classic sort of papers in the field, um, you know, some of the work from Christakis and Fowler, some of the work coming out of Martina Morris's shop, some of the work coming out of the diffusion of innovations from Rogers and Valente, right? So all of this work um, uh, focused on ways in which people's behaviors, if not their actual illnesses, spread through the network. And what makes networks interesting in that sense, from a disease standpoint, is that you don't care so much about a person's individual behavior. It's not the number of sex partners they have, but it's who those sex partners are and how they're connected to other kinds of risk pools that put people at risk. And so this is the heart of the connectionist model of social network analysis. And you know, I, it's been studied a lot, not for an unimportant reason. It's, it, the, the, the point, of course, is that it is important and it does affect our health. And it does seem to be um, a big part of any of, a, of us who've lived through you know, the last contagious pandemic for the last two and a half, three years, um, I can only, you know, not help but appreciate. Um, so I, I don't want to dismiss it as being unimportant. I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I've eaten this hamburger a lot and I'm ready for some chicken. So, um, all right, so uh, going off to uh, just a little bit on this, let's see if I can get the right slide show up. Um, uh, Brief version, yes, okay. All right, so the full set of slides are on, um, uh, uh, you know, on the, on, the, on the drive. And so please, you know, grab a few of that. I've hidden some and deleted some judiciously. So it's not really 182 shots I'm gonna show in the next 20 minutes. Um, though, you know, I, I wouldn't be beyond that. So um, I don't wanna go that far. So the, the, the diffusion and peer influence sort of model um, you know, is it covers a huge swath of topics, and so the the classic one like we've now all seen these diagrams, um, you know, on the nightly news these days. It feels like um, the classic version of a diffusion problem is the compartmental, um, you know, um, SEI or SIR uh, model, where you have some nodes that are susceptible to disease, some nodes that are infected, and a series of rates that um, govern the mixing between those two populations and the transmission of a node from one set to the next or a person from one set to the next. Um, these models are beautiful. I mean, they are really elegant. And um, if you look at how they're done well, and I think they, the, the quality of these kinds of models has improved just dramatically in the last three years. And the, if you look at, instead of these really simple four compartment models, you'll get age graded versions, space graded versions, um, other types of states. Um, there's a whole sort of body of stochastic modeling that's built into these now. So um, the extent to which epidemiologists, and I think really just, you know, not to toot our own horn, but network informed epidemiologists have um, thought carefully about the ways in which um, uh, these, this basic insight of the, um, you know, the compartmental spread model um, uh, can be thought of and made realistic, it has really been just rich and wonderful to watch. And so um, that all said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking on it, but if your interests are in the diffusion, I, I think we're, I, I do want to say, I think we're at the point in a lot of network modeling now um, and, and good um, differential equation modeling um, that if your goal is to do a, a model of disease spread, um, you kind of need to show that, that this won't work. Right, you kind of need to show that um, these sets of models aren't sufficient for the actual public health threat in, in play. Now, it turns out that that's not hard to show for a whole class of diseases that spread slowly or are hard to transmit. So, all your sexually transmitted diseases, all your really hard to transmit diseases, um, anything to require prolonged contact, those kinds of things, these models don't work nearly as well. And the super simple versions of these models don't work well. You need feedback loops. You need other ways to get, you need the transmission rates to change when response, the degrees of response and so forth. So there's lots of ways in which the simple models here don't work, but the complex models here can be pretty, pretty impressive these days. That's just a way of throwing that out there. 
what they show, and all these models are sort of fun ones. This is the, my, my favorite is the example of, a, of, a, uh, of these kinds of models. This is the zombie apocalypse model. One of these states is zombie. Um, that's what the Z stands for. Um, but even if it's not a zombie, right, you have this classic infective curve and susceptible curves. The beauty of zombies is you don't come back. So once you have a population of everyone being zombies, then everyone is in fact zombies. Um, but there's lots of different ways in which these models um, can move. And I think they're, they're really fun to think about. Um, the, the main reason that they fail when they fail is because what these models assume um, in, all, in almost all cases is that your, the underlying population looks something like this little critter on the right. It looks like a random contact probability. In fact, the, um, the homogenous mixing assumption of these models is stronger even than this picture because um, this picture is fixed. And in the constant probability model, it's, the, it's not that there's a fixed random graph, but it's that at each given moment, everyone has an equal probability of connecting to anyone else in that cell. And so it's a much more loose assumption. It's a very strong assumption that applies a very loose structure. And in fact, the real world never looks like that. The real world looks more like this thing on the left. Um, and the, the way you get these kinds of models that make that really bad assumption um, about random mixing to work is to um, break that model up into lots of little chunks each of those little chunks, which then look much more like this, you know, meet that assumption better. And then you have the links between those chunks governed by some set of parameters that are more reflective of the macro structure of a real population. Um, and so the solution to the problem is to turn it into a network, right? And so effectively that's what's doing is that these are those meta population models of various sorts. And what you've done in the process of doing that is create a network of collectivities and then inside each cell of those networks of collectivities, you have a, a simple random mixing process that's occurring. Um, what we like to do instead is to start with the network and say, well, let's just, I, I, don't, I don't know what the compartments are. I haven't done that kind of clustering problem yet. And instead I want the network itself to tell me, or I have a, a, a situation that I want to understand how different structures of those situations are going to change the spread of disease. And so what we do with the network is that we um, actually sort of simulate the way things move through the, through the network. Um, this is really, I think, a nice way of thinking about these problems, is that you can take any observed graph and ask and play what if scenarios with it. You can sort of run diseases through the network um, by, um, uh, you know, by simulation and see what that looks like. And that summarizes sort of a latent space of what the network could look like, what, it, it, what the diffusion could be like in that network. And so this is the um, result of doing that little exercise on this network on the left. And I did it you know, a bunch of times at a bunch of different parameter levels. PIJ is the um, uh, probability of transmission from I to J, with I being the person who has the bug, passing it on to someone who's, who they're already really connected to, who's susceptible. And I think one of the things that I like about this particular graph is that it highlights that um, you know, under certain situations, um, uh, things are clear, right? So if the probability of transmission is really high, then you get these really tight bands, right? There's not a lot of variance. But there's this whole set in the middle here where the world is, and this is all starting with the exact same start node, right? So this is a, a very constrained set of where we're going. And what's interesting in this case, right, is you can still get these wild heterogeneous transition uh, uh, transmission trajectories. And I think that um, most people's intuitions don't appreciate that. Like this is something that it's not, it, it's our intuitions tend to be much more regress to the mean, if you will, um, whereas the real world is just hugely heterogeneous, in part due to pure random luck. Um, like, you know, one node happens to transmit it a day later to a different person, or the disease goes down one branch versus another. Those kinds of coin flips lead to very different heterogeneous outcomes. And that heterogeneity, I think, is often not appreciated um, intuitively by most of us, whereas networks think that too. Um, if we care about network over diffusions, then we might ask ourselves, what are the features that govern diffusion on the network? And I like to break the problem up into structural problems and temporal problems, because they're, for most features, they, they, those are the two governing factors, conditional on the disease features. So I'm going to hold constant the things about the bug and just focus on the things about the network that's going to govern the spread of the bug. Um, and it may not be a bug, it could be an idea, there are tweaks to it, um, we can get into that, but I'm going to say bug because that's what I'm feeling today. Um, uh, and so what are the features in the drive this? The, 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 the short story is that 
something can be transmitted down a network only if it can make its way down long paths in the chain. So that's the governing sort of micro unit of diffusion is a path in the network. And so if you think about what happens, you flip a coin at each edge and at each edge, it has a probability of keeping it going or not. And so if your network was really just one long telephone wire, then the probability of it making it very far down that one telephone wire is like eventually you're going to flip two falses in a row and the thing's going to stop, right? So the probability of transmission always decreases with the distance on the network. And that's just a feature of the end condition of any cumulative probability sort of process. So what does this also mean? This means then that um, if you have lots of um, paths, and I'm just going to jump ahead here, if you have lots of paths, you can get around that, right? So this path fails, that path doesn't. And so the multiple paths create alternative paths, you know, alternative routes through which the bug can, can, can pass. So it's not just that um, the distance matters, but the number of paths matters. And the number of paths don't matter just because you have more people who are infected. Um, even if you only start with a single infected seed, having multiple paths really is an opportunity space is what's being governed. It's where does the bug have room to go as opposed to where, sort of how many people have it in a given moment. The other thing that I think is, is interesting to think about is this notion of clusterability or local clustering. And what, what that does is it governs sort of the, you think of clustering as like a, um, this kind of local clustering, this triadic closure as um, the railroad switch on these paths. So how likely is it that something's gonna keep going a long distance versus fold back in on itself? And so if transmission were certain and you wanted to be efficient, what you would do is you would make sure every person like goes to new people. And so if you were an old part like me or my grandparents, um, if you wanted to get the messages out in the world quickly, you had these things called phone trees. And a phone tree was a list that your church handed out that every person had on their you know, kitchen table that if an emergency happened and you got the call, there was a list of certain people you were to call, and no one was repeated on that list. And so the whole idea was of a super efficient spreading system. And um, it was almost as efficient as the gossip network in my hometown, but it worked really well at sort of moving through the network. Real networks that aren't engineered to do that um, are much less efficient. Um, they have this feature of closed loops. And so for the same number of edges, I'm going to learn a secret I'm going to tell it to Peter. Well, Jimmy's already told it to Peter. And so in some sense, Peter is getting that information twice. And I've wasted my time telling him because Jimmy already told him. And so that kind of cyclic nature makes the, net, the spread of a bug in a network less efficient. But it makes it a lot more robust. And so this is a trade-off on what the, what the topology does. So if your probability transmission is really low, then the fact that two of us have a potential to tell Peter what's happening means that it's much more likely that at least one of us does. And so there's a straight off between efficiency and robustness um, on any given uh, level of, de of density. As I've said that, the multiple route idea gives, this, um, gives rise to this whole notion of cohesion, which I talked about um, uh, a bit on the first day. But the whole notion is that a cohesive network has lots of these threads that are used to pull people together. And so if those threads are independent, if they're not sort of linked to the same knot, then it's possible that they can be effectively twisted into a cable or a rope in a way that a single thread wouldn't. And that's what, that's what the intuition behind this idea is. Um, Jimmy probably recognizes this graph and it's been around since he was in graduate school. Um, uh, this is one of the first uh, images that came out of the Colorado Springs uh, Project 90 data set um, that uh, 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 a bunch of folks that we worked with back in the day collected. And one of the, this is one of the first data sets that clearly in the same population overlapped commercial drug users and commercial sex workers, IDU drug users and commercial sex workers, and made clear that part of the problem with the spread of disease in these two different kinds of mode modalities is the structure of the network. The drug sharing networks were highly locally redundant. You had these really dense clusters of nodes that tied to each other over and over again. And so if a disease moved through one path and stopped, it was likely to go around into the other. Now, needle exchange networks are also dangerous because PIJ, that probability of transmission, is much higher if you break the skin barrier than any other way. But it just gives you this idea that there's a structural analog to something that's less dendritic than happens in the sex world. Um, finally, we have there is a, a node heterogeneity effect from the topology, which has to do with whether or not some most of these networks have really long tails, like some nodes that have lots of ties. 
those nodes occupy a, um, a router position where they, become, they can be super spreaders. So if you have a node that is by themselves connected to lots of people, they have the opportunity, um, uh, if they become infected, to, to reach lots of people in a single step um, or to be the linchpin that holds the whole network together. And so this is the intuition behind some of the early work on scale three networks. And um, the, the, the logic of those ideas and what you'll learn if you go back and read some of the, those old papers um, is that um, these networks tend to be um, very robust to random disruption. So it's really hard to stop the spread of a network that depends on these kinds of star-like nodes because they're hard to find. But if you can find them, the network's really easy to break apart. And so this leads us to some strategies of trying to identify the nodes that are most likely to be these like, high connectivity spreading nodes on the network. Um, there are some interesting ethical questions about trying to find those things that it might be fun to think about, but um, it's a, it, that is one strategy built on the topology. Um, this also speaks to why one of the first measures you're, you're interested in diffusion, you end up calculating is this thing called assortativity or disassortativity. Um, that's whether or not high degree nodes are connected to other high degree nodes or whether or not high degree nodes are connected to low degree nodes. In an assortative network, high degree nodes are connected to other high degree nodes, and that has a reinforcing um, uh, effect on the path structure. Whereas in a disassortative network, you get this very bursty network structure because each node is essentially, each high degree node ends up being a hub to lots of other um, uh, branches. And so if you can reach those hubs, you almost always reach all their branches. All right, um, the, uh, there's some whole emergent things that in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through right now. Um, there's some really pretty pictures there, um, but I wanna get to the second piece um, uh, at least, which is to say that um, the other thing to keep in mind is, is timing of the network. And the main story here, and I have a whole long thing to go on here if you want to get me ranting, um, which is about um, overlapping in time. And, and the intuition is that for slow to spread and hard to spread pathogens like HIV or other STDs, um, that if the networks overlap, if the timing of relationships overlap in time, you've created a difference in the potential spreading path structure in the, what we call the exposure network. It really multiplies the number of opportunities of where the network can go. So it turns out the concurrency matters, not because of the number of partners people have per se, but because their timing multiplies the number of, of, of potential spreading paths you can have. And the simplest way to see this is to take the exact same contact structure, in this case a ring, and change the timing on the edges. And so in this case, all these edges happen at the same time. So a, a disease could spread clockwise or counterclockwise through this network. Each person could be reached twice you know, from one direction or the other. If instead you put timing on this network, you'll see that the reachability drops dramatically. In the exact same contact network, can differ between having perfect connectivity to almost um, impossible to reach anyone else based purely on the timing of the network. And this all has to do with this compounding branching structure that concurrent relationships um, create. And I have other things about how that affects. Um, in recent years, um, there's been a, uh, Damon Santola introduced and uh, Michael Mason introduced this idea of um, complex contagion, and that this is a, the, a much more sociological idea of how contagion works, and it's built from some literature in uh, uh, coming out of um, social movements uh, and uh, threshold effects and social movement participation. And in that literature, what became clear was that people would only engage in high-risk activism if a certain number of their friends also engaged in it. And this, I think, gave Damon the idea that that's probably true for lots of contagions in the network. And so I need to have some number of my peers adopt before I'm willing to take the risk and adopt. And so in this little network, what I'm trying to illustrate is if these are our first two adopters at time one, then the only people in this network that have two of their peers that have already adopted is this node. So this node adopts, and then only will this person adopt. Um, and you'll notice that these two blue nodes, they never have two of their peers that are um, have also have already adopted in order to expose them. So there's a natural sort of self-limiting characteristic of the diffusion because the close tie structure isn't diffuse enough um, uh, to allow those nodes to ever have a partner assuming it started where it did. And that actually leads to some really interesting um, sort of uh, localization, naturally um, uh, constraining localization effects of uh, diffusion, and I think um, that that question of the of this hasn't changed much, but it's a really um, interesting problem to spend some time thinking about. 
All right, so I've already been talking much longer than I wanted to. You take that disease model and you put it into a process of peer diffusion, and you can ask this question about peer influence. And so we've now moved from biology and compartments to biology on networks to ideas on networks. And the basic idea of dealing with ideas on networks is to say that the diffusion process is governed by this equation, which is this equation two here, where you have some personal influence process that, uh, that relates a network, which is W, um, uh, a gift that, that turns my past effects into my future effects. And that's balanced against whatever my initial starting position was. What's beautiful about this model is that it's, it is really a spatial autocorrelation model applied to a network space as opposed to a geographic space. So all the tools we have from um, spatial autocorrelation networks models, we can build into these models. And there are lots of different ways you can play with this network. And what I do in the slides is I go through a whole series of these kinds of examples, which in the interest of time, I'm just going to quit. Um, and just to say that there are um, lots of ways that you can get to these models um, uh, that I think are quite interesting. What's nice about the network autocorrelation model is that it gives you a, a, a really interesting way to parse out different network effects. So I could have a W that's based on friendship, another that's based on you know, co-membership and, and activities, another that's based on kinship, right? So you could have these inseparable effects. Um, you can also have them change over time. You can come up with different parameterizations of the peer influence. So it could be an in-group in weight versus a cross-group weight. You know, the level of sort of flexibility at the research's disposal is really high. Um, the vast majority of models are not that complicated. People just do the off the shelf basic model, um, which is fine, um, but I think there's room for creativity there that uh, hasn't been fully exploited. These models are not causal. Um, these models are associational. Um, that doesn't bother me, it bothers other people. Um, I'm happy to, to blather about why that's the case, but I'm less interested in the causal feature. I think our theories are better than that. And the good causal models have shown the effects um, uh, where they're supposed to. So I'm happy to go into that in detail, which is what I'm going to stop with, um, just in the interest of giving you a chance to say something um, before I stop. All right. I should have given I should have given this one uh, a little time. Yeah, that does long predate you. There you go. <laughs> All right. Any questions or comments? That was really fast. I apologize. I have a question um, okay. that, I, that I've been curious about and sort of struggling with. So there's, you, you kind of described there's this like long, long bridge element that's particularly uh, important when there's uh, sort of like a bug or something like that, that that's transmitted with only one tie. And then there's these wide bridges that are important when um, we're communicating complex ideas and it's tough to change. One thing I've always been curious about, this kind of came up when I was looking at the diffusing stuff uh, when it, with, with COVID, is you don't hear as much about, particularly this is in the context of dynamic network, you don't hear as much about reactivity to several individuals maybe displaying some sort of behavior or some sort of illness, right? So imagine that we have something like a less contagious version of COVID. And so in a robust network, I need a couple of people around me, uh, a couple of connections that that are that have the virus in order to have a higher likelihood of having the virus. But also as a response to noting that other people in my, in my sort of neighborhood have COVID, I might reduce the actual amount of activity that I engage with. And I feel like a lot of these peer influence models like the, the individuals through time are kind of just, just like sit here and just take in as, as many ties from time one as there was in time 10. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to hear from, from people about how they, what kind of models deal with that and how they've been thinking about that. I wow. haven't, oh. oh, go ahead, please, Mark. I was just gonna say, I haven't implemented this, but there's this idea of dueling contagions. Right. Um, which might be what you were going to talk about, which is, I think the in the original paper, they were saying it's not just the flu that's spreading, but also the flu vaccine. And so you need to account for the fact that because you have something contagious spreading, there's also a mitigation effort going on at the same time. So let me see if I can find it. One second. Yeah, that'd be great. No, I think that's a that's exactly the kind of process that's occurring. The under the hood for both of those, you have a, you have a linked process of you know, vaccinated or not versus and that affects your susceptibility. And then you have a spread, you, know, you get the disease first or do you get the um, 
social contagion first, and um, those two then feed back on each other. Um, I haven't seen as, as much of that. I think part of what, you, and I'm just going to riff on it here, what I think I hear you saying is that um, the, the original Friedkin peer influence model is a passive regression to the mean kind of model. At the end of the day, if the network is connected, everyone's going to come really close to um, uh, some kind of a weighted average, value weighted average. Um, it, but that's because of the way that W is structured. So W is structured to have a, a row normalization of one and all the coefficients, all the values are positive. Um, there's nothing saying that that has to be the way you structure W, right? So if it's the case, if I believe that, um, you know, I have a negative effect that when, you know, when Peter tells me something, it pisses me off and so I'm gonna do something else, right? That means his effect in my cell is a negative sign, right? And so I'm gonna move against that. and so. You can imagine being the case that um, you could specify a version of W that has a balancing of positive and negative effects, depending on things like the number of others that have engaged in it or something. So I, I think there's lots of opportunities for that. I haven't seen those um, uh, models implemented directly. You've seen a version of it in political polarization. So the political polarization world has done more of the reactive to as opposed to subsuming in sort of model, but there's no reason you couldn't do it with disease beliefs as well. Other thoughts or reactions? Awesome. Um, like I said, it's, you know, there's a huge amount of work here to be done. Um, I think that the, you know, the, the, the work being done, there's been a, a big bunch of work done you know, over the course of the last 10 or 15 years to establish, is there any causal effect? And the causal effect people have started out saying, well, this could all be selection, it could all be reflection. Um, I think that that idea has been nicely, I think, I think, um, sort of squashed. It is the case that in any given situation, it could be the case that you have selection or you have reflection and so forth. But the 50 years of work we've been doing on this, um, uh, you know, for getting more and more rigorous over time, the, the best tests almost always show that there's some selection and some influence. Very rarely do you find no influence. And so... I think that if you can do those kinds of tests where you have a, a more rigorous sort of causal identification strategy, by all means, grab it. But I would rather, you know, take the data I have available and do something interesting with it that's less causally sort of certain and just rest on the theoretical um, foundation that we have all this other work that gives us warrant for assuming that at least part of that um, effect is causal if not the majority of it. Um, and I think that that at least then opens the door for giving other people warrant for designing other studies. So, so I'm gonna stop there since I'm about to go into Scott's time. <laughs>